Folks, welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's it's fantastic to um, to be here with you, and certainly welcome to this session. It's it's a real privilege to be here, and I'd I'd certainly like to thank um, Simran Kankan and the rest of the team to uh, in relation to putting this event together. Um, today, I'm going to share a few slides with you and tell a few stories and share some techniques uh, and strategies. I will provide some tools and techniques for you and also some some ideas and philosophies around leadership and management. I um, will start sharing those PowerPoint slides shortly. Um, we do have the option for you to engage in questions and answers, so we'll have a, a workshop at the end of the presentation today where we can engage in some Q&A or questions and answers if you will or discussions um, and we can we can work through some issues there. I um, hope you're all fit and well and um, ready to I guess take some information in and, and not only information but hopefully you get some inspiration uh, from what I'm going to share and some of the ideas again philosophies and tools hopefully you'll get motivated and in, in, in keen to um to do something something i always like to do in these presentations is ask you up front um, a couple of things really is i'd really like you to to make a commitment with yourself with tonight that you're going to take at least at least one thing that we talk about tonight and implement it into your life. And it, it, you might get a spark of inspiration or an idea that may have come from a previous lecturer, teacher, speaker, author, whatever it is, make, make a commitment that you're, gonna, you're going to implement at least one idea, suggestion, thought after tonight's presentation, because tonight is all, all, all about helping you become a better, a better person, and I say say that very deliberately to become a better person before a better manager or leader because yeah, before we can become good leaders and managers, we need to be uh, good people, if you will. Uh, so lots lots to talk about, lots to think about tonight. Um, so please make that commitment. I always I'd also uh, like to ask. And I think it's one of our poll questions. Simran, if I may, is get a bit of an indication of of where people are from. So if you um if you can put in the chat where you're from, that'd be fantastic. So the team at Health Ovations and uh, IHNA have worked hard to put this presentation together. So welcome. And as we've mentioned in the introduction comments, the theme of tonight is is about leadership and management. So. <clears throat> mentioned before there'll be some how to how to tools and techniques so there will be some direct strategies that you can take away and implement straight away and as i mentioned before make a commitment to put at least one idea into implementation in other words take action and that that is a leadership trait uh, that's point number one is take action be, be assertive with uh, taking action also tonight, I'd, I'd applaud you to take notes of what we're talking about today. So it's always handy to have a pen and a notepad with you and take some notes as we go through some of the content. A bit of context and a bit of background about myself, folks. I've, I've grown up here in Melbourne, Australia, where I currently am tonight. It's it's uh, just gone 7 p.m. here in on East Coast Melbourne, East Coast Australia, I should say. And um, so, give you a bit of context. I grew up here in Melbourne. Uh, there's a photo of my, myself with my family, some of my siblings. And growing up in um, in Melbourne with not a great deal of aspirations to do very well in life. I mean, that that photo there is when I was a small boy. Uh, but work represented a bit of a necessary evil something that i needed to do so 
uh, education and work was was not a real motivation of mine when I was a young boy, a teenager, and indeed a young adult. The <clears throat> the impetus for and the the motivational drive was uh, a couple of personal tragedies. As a um, young adult, I decided to go back to night school, finish school because my teachers suggested, Kevin, you just you're just not smart enough to finish school. You'll you'll never amount to anything really in life. Go go and work in a factory. And you know, being young and immature and and not very knowledgeable, I took this on board and um, certainly didn't succeed very well at school. And I took the teacher's advice and left school very early and worked in a factory. It, it soon became evident that factory work was pretty bad, to say the least. It was extremely challenging and, and awful. So, you know, working in extremely cold conditions, hot conditions, dusty, dirty, and feeling pretty miserable about not only work, but myself. And um, so over the years, I took myself back to night school, finished, uh, finished my secondary school, went on to university, completed a master's degree in business administration, at, um, at, and also started to change my work, got out of that awful job and got into more uh, uh, growth type of jobs. When I say growth, I mean opportunities for me to learn and develop and, and grow as an individual, as a person, and indeed as a, as a leader. Uh, and a big part of that was having some self-belief and certainly determination and having that family support behind me really helped in reflection really helped me able to reinvent oneself to be able to do that <clears throat> i share that brief story with you not so you stand up and, and say oh kevin you, you it's fantastic i'm certainly not alone there's lots of success stories out there however i do share that uh, story with you how my personal journey in terms of how I went from a non-leader, uh, if you will, to a to to a leader, not only as, an, as a leading myself, but also in some of the jobs and careers that I've had, where I've had leadership positions, where I've managed staff, some other positions I've had where I didn't manage staff, but I had a significant leadership role. So the the things we'll talk about tonight, will today this this morning. Uh, will be coming from not only my personal experience, but also some of the many courses I've been on and part of my master's degree. And also, I'm a, I'm a published author too, folks, so I um, thought I'd share that with you. So thank you. I'm married with two healthy, happy children, which is fantastic. Let's move on. So some of the key themes today, and we'll be talking about the, uh, ooh, there's a spelling error there, the uh, psychology of leadership and being able to, some of the practical things we'll talk about tonight is the notion of, of uh, giving you some tools and techniques. So I, I mentioned it before, I will give you some really structured tools so you can implement some of these things fairly easy. So again, please take note. Um, how to influence people with positive expectations of, of your organisation, particularly in a hospital or medical set, setting. Uh, executing onboarding is paramount and getting getting it right is, is paramount to success, not only in the health industry, but also you as a manager and, and a leader. Uh, we are, and please don't make any excuse for this uh, we are in the people business, full stop. We are in the people business, full stop. So reflecting on that, you as a leader, you are in the people's business. So if that's your business, then you need to, as Tom Peters says, give a damn, really, really care about your people because the people are your business. You are in the people business. So let's let's don't lose sight of that fact that yes, you might work in a, a dental, dental clinic environment, a hospital ward, 
or administrative type of environment, but as a leader, as a manager, we are in the people business. The other key theme that will come out tonight too is the importance of training. Uh, not only from a training from a compliance point of view, but also training in terms of people development and and communication skills and problem solving, decision making, those sorts of things. So I've put their capital investment. I've got some some data to share with you later on in the presentation. So, folks, about the themes of today, yes, it's going to be a, some philosophies, uh, psychology, and also some uh, some practical tools that we can use so and the overarching purpose of today is to develop and build your knowledge and skills particularly in in people in across the health sector to really make a better you I may have said it in the introduction comments that for you to be a better leader of people you need to be, need to be leading yourself personally in a better way So the psychology of leadership, and I do apologise for the typo there. The uh, <clears throat> the and Warren Bennis talks about this in some of his books on leadership. Warren Bennis, a famous a, um, American author on leadership and management. Some of the key things around um, the psychology of leadership and and why people will follow or take take the lead from a leader. And there's people that people that we trust. People that we trust. Leaders also have a sense of courage. And as Tom Peters talks about in lots of his seminars, and that's an author, Tom Peters, and I'll share more about him a little bit later. M W M B W A is, and forgive me if you've heard this before, but it's management by walking around so if you're in a leadership role get away from the office get away from the computer and go and walk amongst what's happening in your operations in your hospital ward have a good knowledge base talking about they are skilled and they're knowledgeable in in their technical field and when i say technical field I don't, i'm not necessarily talking about technology per se, but their, their, their expertise may lie in um, medical expertise, a certain um, discipline in medicine they might have expertise in, or a, a body of knowledge in law, medical law or general law or in accountancy. So technical knowledge or technical skills may, may apply to some of those those attributes that we, we can have. And leaders are passionate and enthusiastic about their organisation, their industry, and their people. They're passionate. They love it. Folks, a couple of examples. I, I, I was rather horrified in recent times. Uh, well, this is going back a few years, and it relates to the health industry where there was this there's an organisation here in um, in Australia that provides home nursing services, where nurses would would travel in cars to people's homes and provide nursing care in in people's homes. So this organisation quite widespread and um, and uh, quite a major player in that in that particular uh, service providing service and what was interesting in in terms of trust one of the senior managers of this organization district nursing they were traveling interstate so they traveled in their car at the melbourne airport which is a pretty normal thing to do this senior manager gets out to melbourne airport parks the car and is walking across to the terminal and notices one of the uh, company cars, because the company cars are branded, and notice one of the cars sitting there in the airport. And this manager was a bit bit concerned. Why 
is one of their cars parked in at the long or at the car park at Melbourne Airport. So this manager gets on the phone, telephones headquarters, and in a very abrupt and rude manner, rings up and says, "Who owns this car?" And she recorded the the registration number and the vehicle number. Who owns this car? Yada yada. It's parked out at Melbourne Airport. What's going on? In a sense of lack of trust of you know what what's going on not and and people at headquarters made some inquiries and found out the car was parked out at Melbourne Airport because it was there because one of the other managers had left it there to go into state to attend a conference go to another city in Australia and so the car was parked there for quite legitimate work reasons but the question is the question is, you know, does that when you get the senior managers ringing up headquarters in an abrupt, rude manner, asking about why one of their vehicles is parked out at Melbourne Airport car park? Now, to me, that rings bells of a lack of trust in the people that work in this organisation. So leaders have got to be be able to be trusted. Now, these sorts of little examples can filter through the whole organisation. And this particular one certainly did. And, you know, once you accumulate a number of these situations and these behavioural patterns from some of the leaders and managers, it can have a diminished um, view in terms of the culture and trust amongst the leaders of the organisation. So I share that pessimistic, sort of a negative story, but in reverse, leaders need to be uh, have a sense of trust. You know, if people share something with you that is confidential, please keep it confidential and, and don't, don't share it. So some key points there in leadership, um, trust, courage, management by walking around, have that self belief and that uh, self-image that you are an effective leader, be, develop your knowledge and skills and be passionate and enthusiastic about what you're doing. Also, the um, uh, open to be, uh, there we go, self-belief and self-image, open to learn, open to learn, be willing to be corrected be willing to think your previous perceptions, your previous hunches, your previous um, understandings may not be correct. They might be partially correct, but be open to to learn. So leaders have that characteristic, almost a playful, childlike attribute of being open to learn and experiment and play with things in in that sense. Uh, set personal and professional goals. So have those, whether it's workplace goals, and in fact, please don't limit your goals just to workplace. We need to have a work-life balance uh, of you know, family, health and well-being, spiritual, religion, family, social, and obviously financial, economic, and, and career type goals. So look at setting some goals across those parameters because we want to we want to develop a a well-rounded, well healthy individual. Have have a future vision for not only your organisation but also your your yourself, where you see yourself in two, five, and ten years from now. Where do you see yourself? So if somebody was to ask you, hey Peter, where do you see yourself working in five years from now? You'd want to tell me what what your future is, what it looks like. Learn from mistakes. Develop mentors and coaches. And and mentors and coaches don't necessarily need to be people you know, although it can be ideally if coaches are people you can work with. But mentors can be somebody that inspires you, um, and they might be another on the other side of the world. You might read their books or see them, or they might have sometime past and 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 so on so mentors and coaches are important for leadership and the adage of read 
read and then read some more. Develop that, that vocabulary, improve your vocabulary. All leaders have a vast understanding of the language and can draw from, from their vocabulary to articulate what they want and need to explain or influence or demonstrate or lead. So nothing substitutes from a person that reads and embellishes the English language or whatever language that you are working amongst. I suggest most of you are looking at the English language, but please forgive me if if, uh, if you're from a country and I understand people of, from all over the world, including um, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, I think we've got Germans, uh, Indians, um, and uh, New Zealand people amongst uh, the participants today. So welcome everybody. So yes, if um, read and you know expand that vocabulary. A couple of the books, and I, I've mentioned this person before, is Tom Peters uh, on uh, on leadership. Does so the book there he published? or several, several years ago, and the book's titled In Search of Excellence. It, yes, the book is dated in terms of reference to some of the companies that are either have been bought out or no longer existing. Some of the technology may be a little bit old. However, some of the philosophies and ideas are certainly not dated. The other book that um, part of my research today was Extreme Humanism. Another book by Tom Peters. I'd, I'd highly suggest and recommend that you, um, part of your development is to get access to some of these books. I did mention a um, book before by uh, Warren Bennis on becoming a leader. So any of you that have studied management or leaders, leadership would have probably come across some of these authors before. So. Now, <clears throat> let's have a look at where we're going in terms of of leadership and business success and part of that part of that story and it is part of that story is that we need to be hiring the best people for or the most suitable people for the particular roles and skills that we need to fill and hiring is a skill and a skill that is often, particularly in an Australian context, that is under underappreciated and is not considered uh, important, very important. However, as a lot of you are probably aware, that once you get some people in a workplace that don't quite fit or don't quite have the necessary skills and knowledge base to carry out their job, it can be problematic from a team working point of view and and can make the roles of leaders and managers very challenging to be successful to say the least so so hiring the best people is often often good so and what we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit more detail so now without sounding too obvious and I do apologize I often get a bit concerned with these seminars that I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not necessarily going to be sharing anything absolutely brand new. And it's it's somewhat concerning that, that I, I do a lot of these seminars and I share a lot of these things and people think that's, that's, that's good. So please forgive me if this seems a little bit elementary or a bit, bit common sense, but it, business is often about common sense. So, Hiring people for the suitable jobs. If you're hiring people that are going to be working in administration, ensure that you ask the relevant questions that that is pertinent to that particular role. Same with how they deal with customers. And customer service questions don't necessarily have to apply to a person working in a call center or in a retail uh, in a retail setting. Yeah, customer service. Remember, uh, 101 in business, customer service, not only we have external customers, and yes, that applies to 
a retail setting and, and um, call centre environments, but it also relates to internal customers. Working in a large hospital, you've got many internal customers. You've got other parts of the business, you've got all the clinical care, lots and lots of other areas of the business where the business, and I'll call it the business, the organisation, if you will, can't run successfully if people are not supporting each other. So customer service paramount in terms of internal internal um, teamwork, ask questions about how people function and work within a team, communication, negotiation skills, problem solving, decision making, all these, all these foundation skills, if you will, and, and um, are important for you as a leader and a manager to, to get the right type of people. And sure, during the process, you might not be able to, to mark off 100% with all those things. However, you'll get a sense of, okay, where this person is at, and if the, if the candidate is successful with the role, you presumably put a development plan together to help them bridge those gaps. The, the other key thing is that the, the notion of willing to grow as a person and as a professional and to be flexible. So some of the key things there. So please take some notes there as we move forward. So hiring pe people, and I'm going to spend some time on, on this hiring because it is, a, it is a tactical skill that a good leader needs to really get their head on around. Now, if your organisation is um, not, not up to date with recruitment processes, then the question is why not? Because it needs to be seriously. Um, so when hiring people, the usual process is that a, a an advertisement will go out into the general public, usually on one of these online platforms such as Seek and the many others, <clears throat> or it might be internally uh, advertised through their intranet. Um, as a screening, go through the resumes, ensure that compliance, um, any of the compliance issues are uh, dealt with early on in terms of it might be a compliance, a legal compliance, that the individual be a registered nurse or, or whatever the compliance be. So make sure those things are ticked off and ensure that the position descriptions and job profiles are up to date in terms of all those things from compliance and also the other terms and conditions of employment in whatever country that you're in, you'll have to, um, depending on what country you, you are in, this will differ from uh, country to country, I assume. So in Australia, it is quite a complex area in terms of employment law and industrial relations here in Australia. It's quite, uh, quite complex. The specialised uh, technical skills and knowledge required in that particular area. Uh, typically, Human resources will look after this function and they, they sh will have or should have the required knowledge and skills to, um, to support the business in, in that function. So here's a, here's a to-do for you, and I've got a few of these to-dos through the session. Review and update all your job profiles and job descriptions. Also the notion of a selection criteria. When selecting good people, you'll have what's called a, or what can be referred to as a selection criteria. Uh, in other words, a, a list of ideal attributes, skills, knowledge, experience, education uh, that the individual possesses. And based on that selection criteria, you can manage a, a good recruitment process. Through this process also of looking at uh, recruiting good people is this notion of STAR, and I'd like you to take some notes here. The, um, the STAR, and the S is, stands for situation. I'll give a pause there for you to, 
write that down. So S for situation, T for task, A for action, and the R is for results. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here when I'm talk, talking about these, uh, this stuff. When, when interviewing people or, or discussing with people and defining a suitable candidate, we, as, as leaders and managers, in, particularly in the health sector, we need to couch our questions around finding the stars. Let me give you an example. So if you are recruiting an RN, a registered nurse for your facility, and they've they've applied for the job, they've provided their CV or resume, and you've gone through the process and you're at the interview stage now. So one of the questions you could ask the nurse is, can you tell me, can you give me an example? It's a great way to, to start a question. Can you give me an example of, can you give me an example of dealing with a problem problematic patient or problematic client? Now, a fairly generic good question that a recruiter would ask a, a candidate. Now, when we're looking for the stars, ideally the candidate would respond with providing you with a situation. So the situation was that the individual was very upset and, and concerned that the patient was quite old, the patient was in her 90s and, and quite frail and concerned about what was going on. The previous nurse had been rude and, and dismissive of, of this uh, patient. And so you you articulate the situation, if you will. What what was what was the scenario? So the situation was the the patient was very nervous and and rude and concerned about the healthcare that she was getting. So that's the situation. So the task that you engaged in was that you sat down with the patient patiently and asked her a couple of questions about what was happening how she's feeling, uh, family family members, and what sort of medication and how often people were seeing her doctors and nurses and so forth. So asking her those questions. So that was some of the tasks that um, the, the candidate was saying that she was doing. And listening very carefully to what the patient had, had uh, had to say. So the tasks and the actions were, were asking questions and listening to what the patient had to say. And as a result of that 20 minute conversation, the, the patient felt more relaxed and more calm and was more open to, uh, to, being, um, uh, to receiving some health care from the nurse and less likely to complain, and that's often been a been a case. So, there's a simple ex example about a, a a nurse applying for a job as a as a nurse in another organisation, and the candidates ask, "Can you give me an example where you've had a, a challenging patient?" So, ideally, the nurse would explain those uh, that situation and the task and the action and the outcome or the result of that in, in that sort of manner. Often candidates will don't know. Most of them will say something like, oh, let me, let me go through the question again. The, can you give me an example of where you had to deal with a, a patient that wasn't happy? Yeah, I, look, I asked a few questions and uh, yeah, we got it sorted out and now she's happy most people will respond in some sort of way like that, which which is fine in some sense. However, you as a recruiter want to make sure this person has got the, if you will, the characteristics that care, that respect, have got the ability to, uh, let me put it bluntly, 
have got the ability to shut up and listen, to listen fully. They've got these some of these attributes and skills. This this is where the candidates will are likely to um, expose that to you as as the leader and the and the recruiter in these situations. So so I want you to think about um, this star this star notion. Now I'm not the first one to talk about this. Has been around for some time. So any of you that are in a situation where you are recruiting people, and let's put it in reverse, if you are looking for a job, um, you can also work this in your favour too as a job hunter. So there's a lots of, lots of material out there in the libraries and journals on the internet, obviously as well. So please have a think about it. It's a very very powerful means of communicating as a, a leader. Now, in a leadership role, you're not a, you're not a, you may not always get the full example. So please jump in when the candidate starts talking to you about a situation. They often will go from the situation right through to the results or the outcome. Stop them. And say, well, how how did you go about doing that? What what happened? Tell me more about this. So see some of the questions to get the candidate to expand further on on the situation. And and when they start to expand, you'll get a sense of of how knowledgeable they are, how skillful they are in terms of doing the the core fundamentals of the job. It's it's a great way to see somebody's skills and their gaps in terms of their knowledge and skills to do. So take uh, so also through the process, another leadership trait is take the candidates on a tour the facility and start an informal conversation. So a lot of people, particularly in a, um, a Western point of view, is once they leave the interview room, they, they relax and can sometimes let their guard down. And by taking people on a bit of a walking tour, as I said, tour to the facility, um, and start a for informal conversation about some of their views, opinions on sport, culture, food, books, movies, uh, geography, travel, you know, they the, the just uh, probably avoid talking about politics and avoid talking about religion, but virtually every other topic. And, and be very deliberate about this. Be very deliberate about starting an informal dis discussion and you'll get some insight into the person. The other attribute of leadership is share the decision process with your team members. Intr so in other words, the candidates, introduce the candidate to the team members and let them get a feel for how this person is. If your team, team members, and this spelling error, um, will uh, will be a really good indicator of how well this person will fit into the team. So you really need to avoid any bad eggs coming in. Please forgive me these, I thought I'd fix these spelling errors, but however, I'm, I'm, I do apologize. Um, at least I keep reading it. Um, so make sure they fit into the team. And that's paramount, particularly in a health health setting where so many people need to work in a tight team. Uh, I'm rather struck when when I visit some of these medical centres, some of the work environments can be quite close knitting. In, in other words, you might have four or five people working in a relatively small uh, space, and they're sharing work desks, they're sharing computers, and it's really important that these people work well together. I'm not, I'm not saying they become best friends, but they work collaboratively, collaboratively with each other and work well. Because if if you get a bad egg there, it can be absolutely toxic and, and poison it amongst the other people. So be very careful. All right, hiring. So hire people that are nice. And this is going to sound ridiculous, some of these words. Nice, people that are empathetic, people that are courteous, 
people are patient, people that have got the ability to listen, people that are warm, people that care, people that smile and have a positive disposition about them. Uh, listen to words like please and thank you. Uh, maybe some community memberships and community involvement. And look for those notions of people that are looking to become better people. Uh, again, uh, be careful of the, the well-spoken, fast-talking you know, people that may come across initially as really good. Just be careful. I mean, sometimes they are very good, but just, just be careful. Um, all right, I, I, I love this quote. This quote um, comes from Brian Tracy in his book, The Psychology of Achievement. Is the, develop the skill of question skillfully and listen carefully. Let me say that again, and I hope you make a note of it. Question skillfully and listen carefully. This, is, this might sound fairly basic, however, well-timed, well-structured questions can have a huge influence on your engagement with, with other people. And again, remember I said we are in the people business, and one of the, one of the greatest cravings we have as human beings is to be respected and listened to and listen carefully. Listening carefully will help you continue to ask pertinent and relevant questions also. So question skillfully and listen carefully. Um, with, when it comes to reference checks, ask some of the questions where they ask the references about the candidates, areas of uh, further development, uh, what areas do they need to make improvements in? Tell me about their past performance, and particularly in, in relation to tardiness and commitment and so forth. All right, so to do, whenever people leave as a leader, look at making an exit interview. Find out why people are leaving. You get some fantastic insight into what's going on in your business when people have if you will, have let their guard down, they've decided, they've made that psychological decision to vacate and leave the business, leave the facility, leave the hospital, and ask them for the honest, candid truth about why. And it might be hard for you to listen, particularly if you're really enthusiastic and passionate about your industry and your organisation where you hear people saying some pretty toxic things, potentially. Um, sometimes people might say that's been good, they're just uh, moving into state, they might be leaving for some, might not want to leave for, um, for various reasons. <clears throat> and depending on the, the labour market uh, demands at that particular time, you do have the option to leave the door open. And when I say leave the door open, I mean leave the door open for possible future uh, engagement with the individual member. Perhaps they might um, look at coming back in another 12 months or year, two years. And if that suits you and the business, then you could certainly explore that option. Now, before I talked in some of the introduction comments, and I know we're jumping around a bit here, folks, but the some of the data in terms of training and education, some of the data when it comes to training and education in in organisations, I, I want to I want to spend a little time now talking about internal training and education because it, it is paramount for not only from a people in the people's business, but also from an organisational development point of view, and a whole lot of reasons. I'll go through them in, in a minute. Um, Tom Peters in his book extreme humanism goes through some data and talks about this and and this would it comes from an american context which probably would resonate pretty closely i'd suggest with australia anyway i i can't speak for other parts of the world but um certainly here in australia would probably be fairly consistent consistent with and it's it's rather shocking particularly when we think about training individuals we you know we, we 
think about industries such as travel and the airline industry for one being being an airline pilot the amount of training that these individuals go through to keep their skills up to date and sharp and on on track these organizations um, Qantas Airlines have got a huge training facility in Sydney and, and other parts of Australia where they invest literally millions of dollars ensuring that their pilots and their um, cabin crew are trained and updated. They have flight simulators that cost a small fortune to not only purchase but to operate. And so there's uh, almost no limit of expense that's spared to ensure that these people are properly trained to do their job and to do their job well. Think about things like the military, uh, the army, the navy, the air force, you know, learning all the various different skills they have to do, but you know, you know not, not only the tactical notion of operating a, a gun or, or something, but all the other skills and attributes. So training and training is so paramount for some of these industries. And it is rather shocking when we have a look at this, this sort of slide, and this according to Tom Peters, is a five out of 10 CEOs consider training to be an expense rather than an investment. That's, that's five out of 10 don't see training as an opportunity, they see it as an expense. No, damn training, we've got to, we've got to spend some money on training rather than investing in training. Five out of 10 CEOs sees training as a necessary evil. No, they've got to do it. There's a compliance sort of training. So it's a necessary, so we've, got, we've got to do it because the government tells us to do it. So it's, a, it's sort of a necessary evil to stay in business. Five out of 10 CEOs consider training as a defense rather than an offense. So again, it has that similar theme, necessary evil, it's, um, it's an expense rather than an investment. The other staggering uh, information that Tom Peters has put here, eight out of 10 CEOs see a typical 45 minute tour de, tour de mission of the commerce, in other words, a 45 minute talk about your business, would not so much even mention training and development in their in their um, mission the conference of the organization so that that's uh, pretty frightening now I mentioned before this data's come from the united states i'd suggest from my experience it's pretty consistent with what i've seen here in australia which is a real shame and the um the heading there is training needs to be a capital investment rather than a necessary evil so some of the some of the benefits in terms of of good let me underline the, the word good good training it reduces staff turnover now staff turnover is a very expensive and costly exercise uh, it's it's it takes a long time and it costs a lot of money not only not only the process of doing but once you get got it on board get the person inducted on boarded and it can take six to 12 months before a person becomes fully functional and, and productive so reduces that staff turnover people feel valued and will um, demonstrate loyalty so people that are receiving good quality training on a regular basis will feel that they are valued by the organization and subsequently be more loyal to the organization People are more likely to go the extra mile, come in a little bit earlier, stay a little bit later, uh, do a little bit of work on the weekend when they're not working. This, um, when people are receiving good training, this is, this is some of the things I'll do. Uh, save time and money in attracting, recruiting and inducting new staff members, team members. Indeed, that very much resonates with reducing staff turnovers. Creates a workforce of choice. Now, what's, what's really interesting here is particularly in the current environment where the job market is very much in favor of people looking for work. 
So if you are looking to come to Australia, there's, there's, there's so much work opportunity here, it's just crazy. So in, in um, organisations that provide good quality training, it will the word will get out that this organisation is good and people will be attracted to that, uh, that particular organisation. So good for you as a leader, you'll have the option to choose amongst a lot more candidates than if your organisation had a poor reputation. <clears throat> more engagement with team mem members, in other words, creating a more positive and, and better and um, more productive work environment and create a sense of culture and teamwork across, across the organisation also reduces those notions of, of sick leave, which can be problematic, particularly in some of the industries where they're short staffed and the health sector is certainly short staffed right across that sector. Everything from your large hospitals to your small clinics, aged care, special needs, pathology, it is all, um, all stretching for staff. So when we can reduce sick leave, then that, that can be a good thing. I mentioned about the um, some of the training, how important it is. And from a healthcare point of view, can you imagine? Now I talked about airline pilots and military people, how to be um, and surgeons and, and doctors certainly go through a lot of a um, lot of training and, and education to develop and dentists to develop their skills and um, and so forth. So people in, even in administrative roles and in support roles also need to have just ongoing training and support to support their skills and develop their skills further. Training soft skills, um, top-notch training that you can get excited about, really get excited. You as the leader and the manager need to get excited about training and we're talking soft skills, so communication skills, self-awareness and emotional intelligence type of training and it's ongoing. It's not let's run a communication skills training today and let's see how it goes in two years we might do another. No, it's it's it needs to be ongoing continuous development. Negotiation, customer service, uh, and the list the list goes on. Provide these skills and this training for your staff and you'll reap the benefits. Team building, problem solving conflict resolution, the list goes on. And it's this training needs to be top notch. It's not just somebody in, in HR, an administration person in HR doing some of this training. You need to invest and get some good quality presenters, lecturers, um, support people to, to facilitate some of this great content. So top notch training in terms of soft skills. And Training's not always around around the notion of sitting in a training room or classroom. It's sure it can be formal education, degrees, qualifications. Our college here certainly provides lots of um, opportunity for formal qualifications, certificate levels and diploma level qualifications. In, uh, it could form in-house courses, so courses that are, uh, are managed and coordinated in-house. So a particular hospital might run a particular course on certain policies and procedures they might have just for that particular hospital. External courses, uh, staff, leaders, managers can go off and do, team leaders can go off and do a, do a course at an external provider. Uh, it could be a local college, could be a local university that are doing short courses. Uh, internal training could involve uh, yeah, internal getting people experts from inside the business, inside the organisation to provide some training in a, in a workshop environment. Training and education can come in the form of mentoring and coaching. Uh, have a some of the larger clinics and hospitals have a professional development library where, where people can go and read and study, see some of the latest journals and publications in that industry. Uh, and you could use a buddy system where you know, match people up to complement their skills and also help them build new skills. And 
and also create a positive sense of teamwork. So training can come in all those various forms. I like this quote. It is um, from Christy, Christy Watson, who's a, um, who was a nurse. What I thought nursing involved when I started, which was chemistry, biology, physics, pharmacology, and autonomy, and what I now know to be truth about nursing is philosophy, psychology, art, ethics, and politics. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So all that technical, all those technical uh, skills and knowledge that um, Christie thought was paramount in nursing really got down to the people listening and the psychology of interacting with people. I like that there. So to do, attract all training sessions, attend all training sessions, you as the manager, you as the leader, attend all training sessions with your team members and support them through that. Get excited about it. Really get excited. You attending, you as the leader, if you attend, this will influence everybody else in the room. Remember, you as a leader, are effectively on show. So you need to demonstrate your passion and your enthusiasm for the organization, your 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 industry and what you're doing in that training. Now Richard Branson, you might be familiar with that name, quoted, I love this, train people well enough so they can leave. Treat them well enough so they don't want to. Now that is so profound. I mean, I've been talking over the last few slides about all this training and going to the expense and, uh, you know, what are you talking about, Kevin? All this training, you know, communication skills this and problem solving that, they just gotta get on and do the job. And when they do get good, they're just gonna go and go and get another job somewhere else. And and yes, they might. They may. But as Richard Branson said, treat them well enough so they don't want to leave. And that's extremely profound, I think. And I think that's something you need to give some consideration to, particularly in management and leadership. Train people well enough so they can leave. Treat them well enough so they don't want to. Richard Branson. Remember, leadership is a transfer of positive of, of energy and enthusiasm. You're on show. So from a scale of one to 10, where do you see yourself in terms of your positive energy? Are you down low around the 20% or up, up higher? And we're running out of time vastly. I'm sorry, we're going over time here. Um, to do, take an honest look at how how you treat your people. How many times a day do you smile with people? What percentage of the time do you invest in listening to people? Oh, yeah. oh are you always in a rush? How many times a day do you say good work, well done, or thank you? Some of these phrases. How many how many emails or texts do you send? a day saying thank you. There's some food for thought there, guys. So to do, have a think about these. And, and if you uh, need to make some modifications, do that. Um, a, a quote by Dale Carnegie, the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. Dale Carnegie's uh, book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. So the, the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. So a simple thank you, yes please, can go a long way, a long, long way. And sadly, a lot of managers and leaders do not do it. And if they do it, they don't, they could do it more. Another quote is, how you treat your people is how your people will treat your clients, patients and customers and each other. So the way you treat people is going to directly be mirrored 
in them engaging with your, your patients, clients, and each other. Uh, <clears throat> this is an interesting quote. When I was at medical school, I spent hundreds of hours looking into a microscope, a skill I never needed to know or even use. Yet I didn't I didn't have a single class that taught me communication or teamwork skills, something that I need every day I walk into the hospital. So that's interesting. Soft skills, as Tom Peters often says, are paramount. So those communication skills, team working skills are absolutely paramount. So folks, in summing up, in summing up, we've talked about a number of things tonight. I know I've jumped a little bit from topic to topic. I hope you've taken some notes. But essentially, we've talked about some of the psychology and given you some skills, particularly around um, recruitment of good people. We talked about the stars. We also looked at the notion of training and the importance of training not only technical skills and compliance matters, but also soft skills and human interaction skills. So in, in closing, I want to I want to finish off with some of these ideas, if you will. Read something inspirational and or educational each day. Develop your vocabulary. Learn a word each day, a new word. Invest at least 2% of your annual income into self-improvement, whether that is money spent for professional group memberships, subscriptions, courses, books, seminars, conferences. The other one, keep fit and healthy. Uh, I do like this quote. I don't know who the, uh, who the author is. One should eat to live and not live to eat. So look after ourselves from a health point of view and be true to your values. Treat others how you would like to, them to treat you. Folks, I'd really like to thank you for your participation today. And I think we can open it up for question and um, answer today. But look, thanks for listening to me. I, I know this is a challenge doing it online. It's um, often a little bit easier in the live seminars where we can engage with one another, one another a little bit easier. But uh, thanks, folks.